seeing is believing. I'll believe it when I see it. What you see is what you get. We put great trust in our eyes. We rely heavily on visuals to tell us what's true, what is real. But often, what we see falls short of our desires and expectations. If what we see and experience truly is all we get, our lives will be filled with disappointments. Faith is being sure of things you don't yet see because of a person you know and trust. Believing in a person is superior to believing in circumstances improving. As situations ebb and flow with ups and downs, a trustworthy person remains steady and unchanging. Even when you want to get more than you see, you have hope in this person to help and provide. Far and away, the greater option for our faith and trust. Jesus is better. And so if you didn't see, uh, one of the main points of Hebrews 11 is that there are things in our lives we don't see, and if we're going to move forward, if we're going to hang on, if we're going to push forward, we need, we need something that we can trust, we need someone that we can trust, and also, I wanted to remind us of the fact that a lot of the sayings we have, I'll believe it when I see it, I'll trust your eyes, these types of things, uh, if they're true, well, then we're going to be disappointed. Because I'll believe it when I see it, oftentimes it doesn't happen. Um, seeing is believing. Most of the times we see things in our life that we're just not satisfied with. That we, if, if all we see is all we get, then golly, I, I think I'm done here. <laughs> because... It's disappointing oftentimes. Or, or when it's not disappointing, that feeling of joy is fleeting and then it's gone and you think, where was, where, where did it go? And so we, we know that we want more than all we can see. We know we struggle to believe things that we can't see. Now there's a very interesting religious position that a, a many, many people in our country believe, they hold. I think even maybe the majority of our country believes in this religious position. This belief, involves, uh, this belief involves a handful of stages that we can't really prove. Followers tend to not be able to totally explain, but they still trust that this religious view is true. Uh, it's a faith-based claim that has a lot of different aspects that followers kind of admit they, they don't fully understand, but they still have confidence in. It's very interesting. This religious position at significant points seems to clearly contradict and go against some things that we know about our world. And this commonly followed belief, which tells a story of the beginning of the known universe, this commonly followed trusted belief, many times observations lead followers to admit, I'm not completely sure how it happened, but I believe it happened. Interestingly, though, this worldview, this belief, it requires faith, this, this trust to believe something you don't see, but it's not usually called a belief. It's usually called a fact. And so why are people so confident in this widely held religious belief, thinking it's, it's as good as fact? Why are people so confident in the Big Bang Theory? Okay, Josh, that's not a, that's not a belief, that's a scientific theory. Okay, well, here, here's two definitions in my head of what a religious belief is. It has to do with the existence or the non-existence of God. The classical Big Bang Theory says no God. Okay, it's not something we can prove, there's no laboratory we can test that in, it's a belief. Secondly, beliefs have, have statements that at some point you have to say, I don't really know, but I trust. I don't really see, but I have faith. It doesn't all make all sense, but I do have faith and belief. And so I guess as we put the Big Bang Theory up to this test, I want you to see that everyone for all time that you've ever met or ever will meet believes things that they can't see. So much so that people are willing to say this is scientific fact, or as good as fact, even though there are significant parts of it that are belief. So I just want, I want to show you a handful of claims. If you are not science-y, I'm not really getting into the weeds of the words and the science. What I want you to see is that this scientific statement, there's some interesting phrases in here. Here's the first one. 
This is from uh, the National Geographic science writer Michael Greshko. He says, it's thought that the early universe contained equal amounts of matter and antimatter, which is oppositely charged matter. But as the universe cooled, photons no longer packed enough punch to make matter. Wake up, don't fall asleep. Po photons packed enough punch to make matter-antimatter pairs. And then like an extreme game of musical chairs, these particles of matter and antimatter paired off and annihilated one another. Okay, so that's the scientific claim of the Big Bang Theory. See this bolded sentence. Somehow, some excess matter survived. Somehow. Okay, do you see in this scientific presentation, eventually we get to a point where someone that studied this has to say, I don't really know how, but somehow. One more. Let's go one more. This one's from an astrophysicist, so way smarter than a pastor. He says, the young universe, we do understand, talking about that around the one second mark of the universe, the young universe, we do understand. The new contemporary, now universe, we also understand. We've stitched together this story, faith statement. We don't fully understand the first few paragraphs of the story, but we know the rest of the book. And so we have an astrophysicist saying, we know a lot. We don't really know how it happened, how it begun, how the beginning of the story, but we do know a lot, and so we trust, we believe, we have faith. That's the implication here. And I ask, is this much different than a Christian saying, I don't really know how the Lord created the heavens and the earth in seven days. I don't really know how he brought man from dust. I don't really know how, but I know the rest of the book. One more faith statement just so you can see that everyone, even the smartest among us, at some point has to get to a faith statement. Sean Carroll, a theoretical physicist, says there's no such thing as what triggered the Big Bang, started the Big Bang. We tend to think when something happens, when there's an effect, then there was a cause, something that made it happen. Faith statement coming up. But here we're talking about the whole universe. There's nothing outside the universe to bring it into existence. It's a faith statement. It's, it's built in his mind on, on different observations, and, and in his mind it is valid, but you have to see at the end of the day him saying there's nothing outside the universe is a faith statement. We can't prove that. Also him saying an entire universe that is ordered on causes and effects, causes and effects, causes and effects was started randomly. And he says, you see, it's different because it's the beginning of the universe. It's a faith statement. And so what I want to see right off the bat is that every single person, when it comes to the beginning of the cosmos, the beginning of the world, every single person makes faith statements. And so as we approach a chapter of the Bible that is abundantly centered on faith, Christian, brother, sister, faith is not weak. Faith is something everyone does. And as you approach conversations with people who say, ah, no, I'm not a, I'm not a religious person, I'm a scientific person. I'm not a religious belief person, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rational person. Show them. All of us are religious people. You've just chosen a different one. And so four points today as we get into our text. One, everyone believes things they can't see. Everyone. Two, everyone is trusting their lives, their lives' decisions to beliefs which they can't see or prove. Number three, Christians believe in a person, not a set of circumstances that they can see. Number four, this person is trustworthy, even when you don't see. So rapid fire one more time. Everyone believes things they can't see. Everyone is trusting their lives to beliefs they can't see. Christians believe in a person, not circumstances they see. And this person is trustworthy, even when you do not see. So let's read our text today and pray. Three simple, beautiful verses from Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by faith the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Pray with me. Lord, we acknowledge that we are, uh, we are silly people who believe things we cannot see, or at least admit it. Uh, we, we, we acknowledge what you preached, uh, what the Apostle Paul preached, and 
said, the word of the cross is folly to many, but to us it is power. Similarly, the the message that the, the word of God created the universe is folly to many, but we believe and it is power. And so I ask that you would help us to really dig down and think about this claim that you created the world. And give us the power of faith, the power of faith in you, and give us the confidence to go to this world and say, I have a better belief, one you can trust. Amen. And so as the Lord watches over his word to perform it, we read his word and expect him to act. And today we read his word just a little bit differently because we have verses one through three. I'm going to go three through one, starting off with verse three and then backtracking. I hope I already showed you that everyone believes things that they can't see. And next, I think, is the point that everyone trusts their lives to beliefs that they cannot see. Verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen, what we know, what we see, was not made out of things that are visible. And so as this author gets into a passage where the, he's defining faith as he enters into a great testimony of faith in the Bible, he starts off by saying faith is assurance of things unseen, and he grounds it, he, he gives the foundation of his argument by saying all of us believe in something we cannot see, which is the creation of the world. He says, by faith we all understand that everything we see was not something we could see. Okay, everyone agrees with this. If you're an adherent of the Big Bang Theory, you believe that that ball of energy was so infinitesimally small that it was unobservable. You still believe that everything you see came out of something you didn't see. So the author is saying, we can have faith when we don't see things because everyone does all the time. Small example. You're married, you say, I'm going to work, I'm going to work. You're believing something you don't see. You're hoping they go to work, you need the paycheck, but, but you're not with them. You might even call their employer and say, are they at work? And the person says, yes, but how do you trust that the person on the other line is telling the truth? You're not in the room with them, you're trusting something you don't see. It's a small example, but it happens all the time. You are trusting that the sun will come up tomorrow. You have pretty good evidence in the past that it will, but you're still living your life based on that. We all have things that we believe that we don't see, and and the author is saying, foundationally, there's one thing that you cannot see that you have faith in, and that is that the word of the Lord created the heavens and the earth, visible out of the invisible. One thing that is striking about um, most cultures, well, actually more just our culture, one thing that is striking is most people don't spend really any time thinking about the creation of the world or the end of the world. I mean, how many times do you go out with a friend and they're like, I was thinking about the creation of the world the other day and its purposes, the meaning behind it, who did it, how, and why? Or would you, would you want to talk to me about death today? Because I'm really thinking if we really nail down what happens when you die, we could get a better idea of how to live. But the reality is, is that why and how we were created and then when and how and why we die and what comes next, those things drive everything in between. We don't think about them. So how does that work? How does that work? Well, I'll give you a couple examples of of origin stories and destiny stories, and we'll just see how they drive our life. So one answer would be, no one created the world. It's always existed. It spontaneously emerged. There's no why. This is most of the Big Bang Theory. There's really no why. There's a lot of how, but there's really no why. We're merely matter. We got created, there was matter, antimatter, pairs, and then somehow there was matter left over. When you die, corpse rots, that's it. No destination for your soul. Well, you can imagine that that would really drive your decision making. There's no purpose for why I'm here, and there's no achievable goal for later on, so just do whatever you want. Just just be at the whim of pleasure and passion and whatever's coming your way. Follow the wave for a couple years and then reset and follow the wave again. Moral choices, eh. I mean, you you have some sort of compass inside of you, but no one can tell you what to do because there's no purpose or destiny. So that obviously changes how you live. Another answer would be probably where most Americans fit, which is God, there is a God. He created the world. It makes the most sense that there's a God. 
But he kind of created the world and then stepped back. He, he's more the divine clockmaker. He, he ordered the gears in the clock, hung the clock on the wall, but he doesn't really have to do anything with the clock now. Maybe if the clock breaks, he'll fix it. But he's not intimately involved, which means he really just wants to make sure your clock's working. Just, just don't break the clock. Don't, don't do anything really bad. Don't hurt yourself or others. Otherwise, kind of follow that compass. You'll get to heaven, and then heaven is a nice vacation where you don't get fat when you eat a lot. So just... He's not really intimately involved, so do what you feel is right. A final answer would be of an origin and a destiny that drive our decision-making would be that a perfectly loving, powerful God intentionally created the world. And he created it not just so that humans could enjoy themselves, but so that they could enjoy him. And actually, they won't find enjoyment unless they find it chiefly in him, that all other pleasures will be fleeting unless they find it in him. And this would, would radically change how we live our lives because that means that this Lord who says you should spend your life trying to understand me, we would actually do that. And then God says when you die, you will be judged based on whether or not you cared to understand him. Man, that's going to change some of your decision-making. I mean, less, less on a whim in your life and more with a purpose, less, less eyes just kind of darting around and more focused like Jesus was. And so with this conclusion that an intentional, perfect, powerful, loving God created the world and that he will judge the world, we spend our lives seeking to know him. And even if we have to give things up right now, we know we'll get more when we're with him. Do you see how the origin and the destiny are so paramount in our lives? An origin and destiny you cannot see. You cannot see what happens when you die. You cannot see the creation of the world. So you have to have faith. Every one of us, believer, non-believer, we all have faith in the beginning and the end of the world, and it drives our decision-making. And so as we approach the Bible, we're approaching a creation story that fundamentally tells us how we should live our lives and as we approach the Bible, giving a creation story that is up against other creation stories, we want to say, does this one make more sense? Does the creation story of the Bible make more sense? When, when Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light because when God says, he accomplishes and God saw that the light was good, and he separated light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. This passage takes faith. I wasn't there. You weren't there. And it's kind of a crazy story. There was a self-existing God who was always there, and he spoke, and the world was created. And so how do we know this isn't fiction? How do we know that this actually is a, is a creation story worthy of our trust? How do we know when we see Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9, by the word of the Lord, this matches up with Genesis 1, that's a good start, by the word of the Lord, the speech of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts, for he spoke, and it came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. Firstly, we see consistent in the, his consistency in the story. See, Genesis 1, he spoke. We see Psalm 33, he spoke. We see John 1, Jesus was the word and he was with God and it was through him that all things were made. Whereas not anything made that was made without Jesus. But that's consistent, different points in time. There's this speaking God, that's helpful. And then we say, does this make more sense of my life? My life as someone, I feel intentionally created, do you? Don't you feel in, like, like you look around and you see people different than you and, and you can appreciate why they're different than you, but in a lot of ways you like the way you are. Like, no, I was created like this. And you were created like that. And we spend time together and sometimes it's beautiful and sometimes it's annoying, but we all know we were created intentionally. We're not just masses of matter. And so you go, check, check mark for biblical Christianity. We know the power that our speech has. We know that we can, we can uplift a brother or a sister for an entire day by saying, I love you, I appreciate you, you work hard and I see it. I mean, you can uplift someone's entire day with a word of encouragement and you can tear them down for a year with the right words. 
We know words are powerful. And so then we go, check box number two for Christianity. Words are powerful. And the Bible says that the word is what created the heavens and the earth. And we start to put these things together and go, well, well if everyone has faith... And, and we're putting Christianity up against other beliefs. This Christianity starts to win out because it's the story of creation that helps us understand why human beings have greater intellect and value than animals. The Big Bang doesn't really tell us that. There's not really a part of that story that teaches us why we can think clearly and cats cannot. I mean, cats can devise plans, don't get me wrong. It, but they can't process the morality of the plans, obviously. God's story of creation makes sense because it's one of the very few that didn't come out of chaos. I mean, if you look at most of the Greek myths, they had these warring gods in war and then out of war birthed power that birthed the universe. And you go, that doesn't make any sense. But in the Bible, you have an intentional creator and you go, well, I like to create. I like to fix. I like to tinker. I like to do projects. I like to draw. And oh, that makes sense because I'm like my maker. Okay, check box number three. God's story of creation makes sense because in, in other stories, you don't really know where sin happens and why. If, if everything is just natural and has always been, how do you make sense of the fact that, there, that there's suffering in your life? Is that meaningless? Well, you're just matter. So don't cry. Your tears are just matter doesn't matter. No, the Bible says, oh, you were created for perfection and you so often see imperfection and sorrow because you have fallen. Check box number four for Christianity. And so we compare this creation account and we say, if I've got to have faith in something, I want to have faith in the story of the Bible. It speaks to my soul. And we're just talking about creation, brothers and sisters. We haven't even got to the creator. And so we have faith, we know we must have faith, and we say, I am fine with the faith in the scriptures. And then when someone comes up to us and says, I'm more of a scientist or a rational thinker, we say, you still have to have faith. Can I offer you a better one? By faith, we believe that the word of the Lord created the heavens so that what is seen was made out of that which is not visible. And by faith, the point one and point two, by faith, we drive a lot of how we live our lives. If the Lord of heaven and earth spoke his word over the earth and it was created, we should probably spend some time learning his word and let it drive our lives. Point number three is that, that we don't have faith in circumstances as Christians. We have faith in a person. Backtracking from verse three to verse two, we see, for by faith the people of old received their commendation, by faith, the old people, uh, people of old received their commendation. People of old, our fathers in the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the people that came before us, the, the people who we got our faith from. That's actually what the entire chapter is going to be about is the people of old. Story after story of how Abraham received his commendation, how Isaac and how Noah and how Sarah received their commendation. So you, you would want to know what a commendation is. We don't really use that word, but we use one very, very similar, which is the word recommendation, a recommendation. So when someone asks for a letter of recommendation, you write a letter of approval. In fact, if you're not going to write approving, you should probably just say, I, I can't do that for you. Because <laughs> if you write a letter of recommendation, it should be a letter of approval saying, I approve this person. It is my witness, my testimony that this person is fit for the job, that you should hire them. And, and so this scripture is saying... The people of old received something, and it was a letter of approval saying, this one should receive. This one should receive. Abraham, you should receive. And what did they receive? Eternal salvation. For by faith, the people of, 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 of old stood before the Lord, and he said, well-pleasing, well-pleasing, well-pleasing. You have my commendation. And so what we know, we know so intuitively that we spend most of our lives seeking the approval of people. So much of your life is trying to approve, be approved of. You want people to see you as a good mom. People see you as a hard worker. You want people to see you as wise. You definitely come into this building and you want to be seen as a good Christian. It's one of the weakest points of our walk as, as Christians is that we're just kind of unwilling to answer the question, how are you honestly in this building, because we don't want to be the Christian that's not doing well. We want approval. We don't want to be the Christian that admits we haven't cracked our Bible open in a month, so if someone asks us, we'll just say something we learned last month. 
I want to be approved of. I want to be approved of right now. I want your commendation. And I have to fight tooth and nail to not preach for your commendation because all of us are seeking the approval of a person. And the Bible is saying seek the approval of one person. Do everything in your life to seek the approval of one person and his name is Jesus. And to seek that approval, to get that approval, to finally stand with Jesus and him to say, I'm pleased with you, it's faith. It's faith because the Bible is clear. You can't work it up yourself. None of you are going to stand before the Lord and he's going to go, you had the most faith in downtown Mission Church. You did it. All those other cronies had less faith than you. I'm so proud of you for the faith you mustered up. You did it by yourself. Didn't even need my help. Also, none of you are going to stand before the Lord and him say, if you just had more faith, I mean, I know you liked me, I know you believed in me, but you just didn't have enough faith. There were some weak points in your life where you doubted. You just didn't have enough faith. No, none of us are going to stand before the Lord with with our righteousness measured by our amount of faith. We're going to have our righteousness measured by whether the faith was in Jesus. And so the person with the weakest faith in a strong Savior has the same Savior as the person with a strong faith in a strong Savior because it's about the Savior, That's why Jesus says a mustard seed, if you've got that much. If you've got enough in your life when you are laying on the floor, crippled spiritually, to even reach out your hand to touch his garment, you are his because of him. That's how you get your commendation is faith. And this faith is in a person, not in circumstances. We so often want want to think that we can fix the problem, we can fix the circumstance, we can drive our own lives, and then we fail, and the response is, we should do better, we should fix this problem, we should drive our own lives, and then we fail, and we say, okay, I can fix it this time, I've learned a lot, I can fix my, and then Jesus is saying, come to me, you are weary, and you have proved that your way does not work, have faith in me, And, and, and get that final approval that you have so longed for. Our faith is in a person, and it's not us. Faith is in a person. This leads us up to verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. See how strong these words are? Assurance. Conviction. Many of you went to a voting booth a few months ago and you voted on convictions and you did not feel weak when you did so. You might have said, I don't know which one to go with, but you probably did not say, I don't know what my convictions are. We have these strong convictions that drive our lives and the Bible is saying faith is strong. Faith is a conviction. Faith is assurance. This word, this is astounding. This word for assurance, the Greek hypostasis, is used also in Hebrews chapter 1. Love the sound of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of the Father's hypostasis, his nature, his substance. Faith is not weak, it is not shallow. Faith is substance because Jesus is substance. It is is not by happenstance that the author uses the same words for Jesus being the substance in front of us of the Father and saying you can have assurance because it's in Jesus and his substance, not in your own substance. Jesus is substantial. Colossians says all of the other forms of your religion, they're passing away, they're old, but Jesus Christ is the substance. And so we see these strong words for faith, brothers and sisters. Let us not let anyone tell us faith is a weak enterprise. Faith gives us assurance. Faith gives us conviction. Why? Because it's not in how full our gas tank of faith is. It's in how steady and faithful Jesus is. And so you can be sure because Jesus is sure. You can be steady because Jesus is steady. All of us have faith in something, but the Christian says, I have faith in one who is unchanging. The point here is faith can be sure when a person is sure. 
Faith can be steady when a person is steady. Faith can be reliable when a person is reliable. And any of you with a good manager at work know this. You know you can go into work with a manager that has your interests. You know you can go into work having a job. You know you can go into work being consulted before changes are made. Any of you with a bad manager know this. You know it's anxious to go into work. You know that you never know if your interests will be met. You know that you don't really know what type of environment you're stepping into because the person is unsure and unsteady, so your faith in that job is unsure and unsteady, but the one with a good manager can go into work with steadiness. I know the manager will be there. Anyone uh, with good parents knows this? My father is steady. He's sure. I can have faith. I don't know what's going to happen in my life. I don't know how college is going to go. I don't know what's going to happen in young adulthood, but I know my father is steady. I know he's sure. I know I can go back to him with my questions. He's steady, and so I have faith. Anyone with bad, <laughs> rough parental upbringing knows this. I didn't know when they were going to be angry. I didn't know when I was going to upset them. I just was unsteady all the time. I could not be sure because the person was not sure. And men hear this. Wives know this. Oh, women know when they can be sure and steady or when they are wavering. They know when their husband is the surest, most steadfast person not named Jesus in their life. They know when they can trust, regardless of what the circumstances are, that someone will be there for them. They know that. And you want to be a man whose wife or future wife or children can proclaim he is steady and sure. I can have faith in him. Only way you do that, have faith in Jesus. So that when you aren't sure and steady, you repent, you go back to him, you say, you are the sure and steady anchor of my soul. Jesus, if I'm going to be anything for anybody, I need you to be that for me. If I'm going to be anything for anybody, Jesus, I need you to be that first for me. It's not about the Christian life. It's not about mustering up enough of anything. It's about being so captivated by Jesus that you then are Jesus to other people. And if you're not captivated by him, you cannot act like him. This is why the Bible, this is why Hebrews is so radically focused on the Lord and not us. Story after story in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, story after story in the Old Testament, story after story in the Gospels of what the Lord has done. So that you can say he is steady. He is substance. I can have firm trust in him. But we, we get back to this idea of needing to see something. How do, we, how do we have faith when we don't see? We still want to see. We like to see. This is where the Bible starts to talk about the seeing of the heart. In Isaiah, the Lord says, I will blind their hearts so that seeing visually, they will not see heart. Hearing audibly, they will not hear heart. They'll see the message. So many people followed Jesus around and saw him do miracles, saw him preach, saw him hang out with outcasts. They see, but they didn't believe. And then they said, more signs, Jesus, more signs, Jesus. He said, I've already given you enough to see and believe. And so when we read the Gospels, when we read this testimony of the Lord from Genesis to Revelation, what we see is a perfect picture of a perfect God so that we might believe. This is what John chapter 21 says. John, in the middle of his stories about Jesus, says, by the way, I'm writing these things so you can believe. And so we come to church Sunday after Sunday. We open our Bibles day after day, and when we don't, we don't think it's about us. We go back to Jesus. We open our Bibles because we need to see Jesus. We need to see this Jesus who came down from a heavenly home to dwell with outcasts. We need to see this Jesus who did not spend his time amassing wealth and influential peers or friends. He spent his time at dinners with the hated. We need to see this Jesus who was willing to give up his entire life, three years of sacrificing his life for a cause. We need to see this Jesus who obeyed his father to the point of death. We need to see this Jesus who was so confident that he could say, I am the only one who will lay my life down and take it up again, but was also so humble that when he spoke and people were in awe, he said, I do not speak my own words. I speak only what the Father has given me. This humble, confident majesty in meekness, Jesus, we see and our hearts say, I believe, because that's the only proper response to Jesus. 
It's not seeing Jesus saying, well, how do I have to get him? What do I work to do to get him? He said, no, no, I just believe in him and he changes your life. By the renewing of your mind and looking at Jesus day in and day out, your soul is transformed. That's the promise of Romans 12. So we can be so sure, so sure, because we're not looking at ourselves, we're not looking at our circumstances, we're looking at Jesus. And brother, sister, he is sure. He is unchanging. Don't you want a perfect, unchanging Savior? He's sure. Praise the Lord that he has given us a picture to look at. Oh, we are weak and we need pictures. Jesus isn't right here, but he's right here. We can close our eyes and see the picture. You can imagine Jesus on the road to Calvary. You can imagine Jesus on the cross. You can imagine Jesus saying, hey guys, I'm back. You can imagine Jesus in so many life circumstances. Because we've been given a picture. So what I want to do quickly as we end today is, is ramp us on to the next six weeks of Hebrews by, by defining faith and applying faith. Defining faith and applying faith out of the book of Hebrews. Here's your, here's your easy remembrance. Hebrews 11.11. 11. 11, 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past, like way, way past the age. How did she receive power? She considered him faithful who had promised. So the book of Hebrews defines faith like this. Consider him faithful who promises. I know that because it's not just once, it's also in chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Why can we not waver? Why can we hold fast to this hope? Because he who promised is faithful. And so here's what the Lord does. In his grace towards us, he gives us pictures of what he's already done that we can believe in when we don't see what we want right now. He gives us promises based on pictures of what he's already done so that we can believe he's faithful based on the picture and believe he will fulfill the promise based on the picture. And so in your life, there will be times where you and your heart cry out, I don't see his faithfulness, but I see his picture. I see my Savior on the cross. I see him who by his wounds I have been healed because he bore my sins in his body on the tree. I see the suffering servant who cried out so that I don't have to cry out. I I see him and I don't see anything else right now. But Hebrews 2 tells me that I don't see everything in subjection to Jesus, everything under Jesus, everything in the rightful rule and reign of Jesus, but I do see Jesus. And that's enough for me today. Because if I can see this picture of Jesus, if I can see this picture of the God who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, I also know that that God is a God who will, with his son, give us all things. I don't see the all things yet, but I trust the one who I do see. This is faith. Consider him faithful who promised. That's why we talk so much about the actions of God and the promises of God. So faith applied, here's just a few examples of things that you might need to to check where your faith is. So when you cannot see the end of a circumstance, you can't see the end of the road, you can't see how whatever you're going through right now plays out, you can't see how it works out in your favor, you can't see, do, do do you lift your eyes off of the life around you and onto the person of Jesus? And you, and you, yes, lament, you, yes, cry out, you say, this is hard but I'm looking at Jesus while I'm crying out, this is hard. I'm not just looking around me going, this is never going to fix, this is never going to get better. This is saying, Jesus, I, I, I honestly don't see your faithfulness right now, but I do see you. And I ask that you would help me. Do you do what Habakkuk did? We talked about Habakkuk last week, and at the end of his book, after crying out to the Lord that the Lord would come back and, and subdue his enemies, he says, you know what, when there's no fruit on the vine, when my body is torn, when there's no olives, when everything has failed me, yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Because my rejoicing was always in the salvation. Everything else is a beautiful benefit. 
We rejoice in the salvation of God and our family is a cool addition. We rejoice in the salvation of God and our property is a cool addition. We rejoice in the salvation of God and having a job with purpose is a cool addition, but we always are rejoicing in the salvation because there will be times where family's hard, job is bad, and all you have is the salvation. Here's another one. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Do you believe that? Or do you look inside yourself and say, he, can't, he, he cannot forgive that one? I believed when I came to him that he could forgive that one, but I've been in it for a while now. I haven't gotten over it yet. I should be. I'm a good Christian. I come to church. I should be over this by now. He's not going to forgive me forever. He's faithful and just. Anyone who comes to him to confess sin, he's faithful and just, and he doesn't just forgive, he cleanses. And if you don't have faith in that, you will not confess the recesses of your heart to the Lord, and you will not confess to people around you. And here's what happens when you don't confess the recesses of your heart to the Lord, and you don't confess to people around you. Those little tiny sins, they start teeming up. They add together, they become like a fungus in a dark place, they grow, they grow, and then eventually they get to a point where you just cannot confess them. And so we, we are a people of confession. Why? Because we're a people of the Lord who when we confess, he forgives. And we're also people who forgive because we're a people of the Lord who when someone confesses, he forgives. Do you have faith in that? Are you willing to live your life based on that promise? One more. Two more. You got time. Two more. Do you have faith that you will overcome your sin? Not just be forgiven by it, but overcome it. If you look at yourself, you might not have that faith. Because you might see a track record of a guy or a gal who hasn't gotten over it yet. But if you look at Jesus and you hear the, the promise of 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24, that says, Now may who sanctify you? The God of peace himself. May he cleanse you. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what a lofty standard to have a blameless soul. But you have a God of peace who will cleanse you completely. He is faithful. He will do it. In your sin, you do not look at your faithfulness. You look at the Lord's faithfulness. You allow him to cleanse you and complete you over and over again the rest of your life. I hope you don't have plans for the rest of your life because that's what it's going to be. Sin, repent, be forgiven, be cleansed. Sin, repent, be forgiven, be cleansed. He is faithful. He will do it. And if you don't have faith that he will do it, you'll be in such despair because you'll never grow. Lastly, do you have faith in Christ's promise that his joy will be in you and that your joy will be full? He's promised it. Before he died, the day before, he said, I tell you these things. What did he tell us? He said, I'm the vine, I'm the vine. Stay connected to me. If you don't stay connected to me, then you'll be as a withered branch on the ground getting covered by maggots and dirt. You'll be worth nothing. But if you stay connected with me, you'll be vibrant and fruitful. And it's all based on if you're connected to me, so stay connected to me. And guess what happens when you are connected to me? The love I have received from my Father, I will give it to you. You want to know how you will be loved by me, Jesus says? The glorious, perfect father loves his glorious, perfect son. And I'll give you that. And then his response is, that's your joy and your fullness of joy. Are, are, you, are you yearning for Christ's love in your heart, this eternal love that cannot be taken away from you, this eternal love that is undeserved, this eternal love that comes with so many benefits, but the greatest benefit is the Christ, this eternal love, and you just say, my joy is full. My cup overfloweth. I've got no more room in the cup. My joy is full. Christ is my fullness. Everything else is a plus. Or is it, ah, Christ has filled up my cup about halfway. I really got to find other things to fill it. And every time I put them in the cup, they disappear. Every time I put them in the cup, they don't add fullness. Every time I put them in the cup, it doesn't work. Do you have faith that Jesus can be your fullness of joy? Maybe you don't see it right now. Do you have faith that he can be and will be the fullest joy you will ever experience? And do you seek it? 
Psalm 16 says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And brother and sister, we're not there yet. But we have faith in the promise because we have faith in the person. We have faith in the promise because we have faith in the person. And faith is assurance. Faith is conviction. And by it, you will receive your approval. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I I thank you and praise you for being so so captivating that we can spend Sunday after Sunday after Sunday speaking of you and it just doesn't get boring. You can hold our attention in a way that no other thing in this world can because we were made for you. That's the creation story. You made us for you. And, and, and the deepest struggles in our life is when we don't seek after you, when we have these holes in our life and these sins in our life because we, we're not doing what we're made for. And so, Jesus, by faith, we understand that you created us. And by faith, we understand you saved us and restored us. And by faith, we understand that you're coming back And by faith, we understand these great promises that you will cleanse us, you will be with us, you will love us as your Father has loved you, you will be our joy. Sometimes we don't see it, Lord, but we do see you. Cause our hearts to worship you in this moment. Amen.